Hiya! My name's Carol and today I'd like to talk to you as always about fabrics and threads and today a really really inspirational woman, Leah Stanzel. So when I first started doing patchwork many many years ago I came across a book in a library that just blew my mind and it was this book that's off to the left, Le Monde de Leia, Leia's World. So this was before there was so much content on on the internet. And nowadays we might be pouring through Pinterest all the time, but at this time it was really, you got your information from the library. So I got this book out and I opened it up and it was just like nothing I'd actually seen before. Patchwork mixed with pearls, mixed with ribbon embroidery, mixed with creepy face dolls and older teddy bears and vintage ornaments, vintage toys. So let's have a look at this book together. So inside, the publication date says 2004 and it starts off with a little bit about the background of Leia Stanzel. Her family is from Eastern Europe and they came to France because of World War Two. It looks like her family were well educated, but that her father couldn't get a job in France um, doing whatever he was doing before the war and that he worked in men's clothing. But we don't really learn an awful lot more and I must admit, when I was trying to find out more information about her life, about what she thinks, about what or who had an influence on her work, there's not as much as I would have liked out there. I would have liked to have seen some extensive YouTube interviews with her where she she talks because she does have a YouTube channel. So there are some clips of her talking about creativity and her attitude is just up my street. But these videos are only a few minutes long. And here we're talking about a woman who's had a huge amount of influence, even just on the people that I know around me. When I first went to the patchwork class and I came with this book saying, has anyone heard of her? Everybody had already heard of her. Everyone knew her work. And as always, I was just the last one off the boat. Actually, I don't know if that's a real expression or if I've just made it up. (laughs) Anyway, I think that the reason that she's had such a massive influence on embroidery lovers and textile lovers is because she has this really free way of embroidering and I always thought of embroidery as such a rigid medium. Her work isn't just decoration, it's an expression, it expresses things, it it makes you feel things and I absolutely love that. So back to the book. So she grows up And she's very bookish and she's interested in philosophy and politics and decorative arts. And she goes to a graphic design school where she meets her husband, painter, Pierre Dessens. So they get married and they have a little baby. And so it is when she is going with her husband to deliver one of his drawings to a women's magazine that she meets the editor of this women's magazine and they get to do a little bit of chin wagging or as I like to call it networking and they get on to talking about her baby's clothes that I guess she knits herself on a really colourful and stylish and not at all like other babies are dressed for that time so this editor asks to see the baby clothes and she finds them marvellous and she wants to buy them all and Leah Stanzel ends up getting a job out of this She works as a stylist for about seven years and she's kind of a, you know, high-flying businesswoman and going off abroad and stuff like that. But she's not feeling it and she's not feeling fulfilled and she's feeling quite suffocated by the fashion industry and the production, production, production side of things. And she's not feeling in a place. So she takes a year off. So like a sabbatical year. And so she gives herself this year to find out more about herself, find out more about religion, take care of her family. And she also decides to learn embroidery. So she learns all the classical stuff, 
all the fancy techniques and whatnot. And she stops in front of ribbon embroidery. She's thinking, wow, what's this technique here? And by this time, it's kind of already almost forgotten. So she's reviving this kind of thing. So she's enjoying the embroidery, but there's still something missing. There's still some way of doing things that she hasn't kind of figured out. And she's thinking that it's the lack of space, not enough space. Mais quoi faire? So the sabbatical year finishes. She goes back to work, but she's still not fulfilled. But then she goes to this textile salon. So she's at this like exhibition and she sees patchwork and it clicks. And she thinks to herself, that's it. That is the space that was missing with the embroidery. That's the background for her. That's the the means of exposing her work. So now she's got a base with the patchwork. She's already got embroidery under her belt and she has to learn patchwork and the assembly techniques. And it looks like this didn't like create any problems for her or anything. She just got her head down, learnt, learnt what she needed to learn and got it done. So now you're getting patchwork going beyond its own own usefulness if you know what I mean it's not just to keep you warm at night and put on a bed it's coming off the bed it's going on the walls it's an artistic medium she's created this kind of surreal universe in fabric and threads but as so often is in these kind of circles when she wants to expose her work when she wants to get accepted into exhibitions they're just not accepted it's considered too quirky for the traditional and too traditional for the modern so they're not having it and she's not having it that they're not having it and she just isn't discouraged and keeps on going and little by little it starts getting appreciated for the for its real value her work and she starts teaching all over the place she's always on the move doing workshops, showing other people how to do stuff. And I really, really like this. This is the kind of attitude that I like, this sharing of skills and know-how and really just encouraging other people to do it. So she writes, I like the atmosphere of women's meetings, like these quilting bees of yesteryear, where we gather to quilt a quilt, where women meet to acquire know-how and flourish. What do you all think of that? Because I really do feel like textiles brings people together. So you get this whole mix of people from different backgrounds. In our patchwork group, different countries, different ages. And everyone coming together for this love of textiles. And sometimes I feel a little bit sad for young people. Because they're not being exposed to textiles in the same way. Even when I was at school, we did very little, but we did do a little bit. And I can remember it really well because I I liked it. (laughs) And I wasn't very good at a lot of things. I struggled with the reading and writing business because of dyslexia. So arts and crafts were a way of expression and a way of succeeding in something. At least it was for me. And I'm a bit concerned that it's been taken away now and a bit look down upon let's valorize it let's bring it back so the other day i was at a woman's house this is a bit of a tangent but i want to tell you about this she had this piece of embroidery over the back of her chair and i was saying oh did you do that it's really nice and what have you and when she knew i was interested in embroidery she went into a cupboard and came back with a book of knitting samples and a strip with embroidery from when she was 12 years old and she's in her 80s now I'm gonna pop in the video so she's kept this precious book all these years and she's rightfully really proud of showing me all these stitches she said it was a long time ago and she can't really remember very much except that she loved it and it was a Saturday morning at school And look at what she could do when she was 12 years old. I can't do that now. 
So I think what I'm trying to say is that, (laughs) what am I trying to say? I have so much respect for artists who give back, give back their time and their skills and their knowledge and encourage others. And if you've been inspired and you've had a good teacher, you might just still have your work from that period in a nice book 70 years later. So she, in particular, talks about how people hesitate to put their name on their work and how it's really important to put your name and a date on your work. She says that everybody is creative, that life is all about creation, the creation of everything, the creation of your your space around you, the creation of a garden, the creation of the food that you cook, the relationships you make. And she talks about this idea of in the West, having a very different attitude to different arts so that you have noble arts, then you had you have poor arts, like neglected arts, almost despised arts. And that in some other cultures, like for example, she, she says that in Japan, you don't judge the medium. You're judging the approach, you're judging the, the value of what you've done. So judging the work, but not the format in which it's presented. She uses the example of going to some sort of chic dinner, lots of intellectuals there and everyone's talking and you ask someone, what do you do? And he says, I'm a philosopher, I'm a sculptor. I'm a, oh, so what do you sculpt? I sculpt stone. And it, everyone's fallen over themselves. Oh, fantastic. Um, even if he just sculpts big poos, it's still, wow, he's a sculptor. And then you say, and you, madame, what do you do? And you say, oh, well, I crochet. And everyone just goes, oh, crochet. And there's a little bit of laughter around the room. Even though her crochet may, uh, might be absolutely sublime and much better than his sculpture. And... Just another little tangent (laughs) that I'll go on is I knew a couple of years ago, a young man, he was in his 20s and he did knitting and he knit an awful lot. And he knit children's toys, well, just like cuddly toys from just out of his head. So he didn't have any pattern for it. And he did dragons, dragons with these like spikes and horns and wings and bumps on their backs like these were just like (laughs) these were just like amazing cuddly toys that he just made about of his head and I was like what a talent what an imagination and when I'd say can you not write these patterns up can you not try and sell them and he just said oh like I don't know how to do that he needed to get out networking he did didn't he but his knitting was largely unappreciated by all the people around him who was who were like rolling their eyes and going, oh, he's always knitting, he is. Wasting his time. Well, no. Right, tangent over. And I'll just say a few more things that I really like about our attitude and then we'll finish. I'm trying to make these videos shorter and they're going on longer. So she addresses the problem of when when people say to her, but I don't have any ideas. I'd like to, but I don't have any ideas. And she says that ideas aren't intellectual things. An idea is an urge. And that the creative process already starts when you're actually collecting those things with which you're going to work. So going to the second hand shops, going to material shops, finding things like in your grandma's cupboard. Um, for me, sometimes it's even in my kid's toy boxes and things like that so she's saying when you've already collected these things that you love because you love the colors you love the textures you love the styles of things and when you put these things out in front of you that's when the ideas come and I must say that I just get an immense amount of pleasure going to secondhand shops and looking at all the different materials and threads and beads and pearls and things like that I I really love it and I think secondhand shops are even better just because each article is different from the one next to it, isn't it? There's no two things the same. And things have got a history and and a story behind them. 
And now we'll just quickly address another issue <laughs> that I really like her attitude with. And that's other people's perception of your work. Sometimes it can be quite devastating when you've done something and you and you're like, oh, I really like that. And then you've got negative comments and all judgy, judgy behavior and things. <laughs> so she says that just don't listen, don't hear it and don't ask. Problem solved. Don't find the value of your work through the eyes of other people. So look, that's enough tangents and rants. <laughs> And I hope you've been inspired by Leah Stanzel. I was absolutely certainly inspired by her work when I saw it. And I would love to have gone to one of her workshops. Her stuff is fun and it's surreal and it's colourful and it's beautiful. So obviously you can look her up on Instagram and YouTube. All the usual suspects. And... I guess I should say, I just, I hope I have got all this information right. There's just not as much out there as I would have liked. But then I guess having said that, I am an Aussie Parker. So like it if you've liked it and subscribe if you want to. Thanks for watching. <laughs>